So I'm going to open up by, first of all, let me tell you, I don't think I'm going to take a full hour for this, but you never know. Um, I'm going to try and allow a lot of time for interaction. I am well aware of what I'm walking into on this one. Um, I've had several people tell me what's been going on here, uh, because when this topic was originally suggested to me, I said, oh, there are probably 10,000 other things that would be better to speak on. They said, no, you don't understand the conversations we've been having. They told me what the conversations were. I've been at conferences in which Steven Spicer has spoken. I was at the uh, Bethlehem at the Crossroads Conference in the Middle East, in which uh, Palestinian Christians were engaged in a discussion. And they asked me in to discuss my view that Israel has a future in the land of Palestinian Christians who don't always think this way. So I know what it is to walk into the situation. I don't think you all are as dangerous as that group could have been. But anyway. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and Gary Burge, who's done a lot of writing in this area, Jesus in the Land, is a uh, Aberdeen doctoral student colleague of mine. We were in doctoral studies together years ago at Aberdeen. He read my copy of Dispensationalism Today by Charles Ryrie and marked it up when he was a doctoral student. And we used to have lunches and talk about this stuff, even though our views are very different on this. And we still have good conversations today about it. In fact, we have sometimes talked about um, taking our show on the road together and showing there's a way to have this discussion without, um, uh, without defellowshipping one another in the process. Um, so, um, so, there's, so there's that element to the equation. You need to know I'm on the board of Chosen People Ministries, an arm of which is Celebrate Messiah, which operates in uh, Australia and in New Zealand. Uh, you need to know that I am uh, I'm a Messianic Jew. I come out of a, my, both my family on both sides were Jewish. I came to Christ uh, as an adult, even though I didn't know I was Jewish until I was a teenager. That's an interesting story in and of itself, how that happens. Um, and then uh, you also need to know that when it comes to progressive dispensationalism, as Mark said, I'm in the middle of this. Um, I was one of three people writing uh, trying to, to tweak our tradition and to make it adjust in light of what we what I felt were legitimate biblical criticisms of dispensationalism that had existed and been propagated previously. So with all that confession on the table, um, hopefully we can begin. Uh, there is little that happens in this discussion uh, that I don't have some awareness of. Just as whenever I go to Israel, uh, I spend time on both sides of the wall. Uh, because I am committed to the one thing about the gospel that is perhaps most important in showing what the gospel is all about, as I mentioned, coming out of Luke Acts, is reconciliation. And I actually think the church is missing a wonderful chance to show reconciliation, even in an area like this. And there is some work being done among Messianics and uh, Palestinian believers that is trying to move in this direction despite the differences of opinion that exist in certain areas of theology. Um, and my hope and prayer would be is that that could be uh, that pursuit could continue to be maintained, because if anything could testify to the power of the gospel in the context of the Middle East, it would be church communities in which Palestinians and Jewish believers were getting along with one another and showing there is another way to do this than the way it's being done in the politics at large. So, with all that as an introduction, let me start with the stereotype. Okay. If you hear the word dispensationalism, you probably think of two things, okay? Charts and TV evangelists, okay? Uh, um, I, I think that most people, when they hear the word dispensationalism, are thinking, here is someone who wants to map out the, the end times, they know exactly where everything happens and what's going to happen and when it's going to happen, and it might happen within our lifetime. They're ready, in fact... When the year 2000 came, some of them probably packed up some food and put it in a building somewhere where they could live away from the center of action to survive whatever was going to happen when Y2K happened, that kind of thing. So that's the one side, the chart side of it. And the other side of it is um, the TV evangelists who talk about the future of Israel and Israel right or wrong no matter what, that kind of thing. Uh, and maybe it's linked to other things as well. There is a lot of dispensationalism. Interestingly enough, dispensationalism isn't limited to, uh, if I can say it this way, the non-charismatic wing of the church, which is actually what Dallas Theological Seminary is a non-charismatic school, but it, it's, it's, it's very prevalent in charismatic circles as well um, because of, I think, the, the way it defends 
and argues for what is called a literal reading of the Bible, which is actually a lousy name for what we're talking about, but it's the way we talk about it in public. Do you believe the Bible literally? And that's, well, it all depends on what you literally mean. Anyway, so, um, uh, uh, you know, we recognize that there are metaphors in the text and there are things going on, but that what is being claimed is a consistent hermeneutic that takes the Old Testament and doesn't redefine it by what's happening in the New Testament, and I'll have to, I'll have to um, flesh that out as I talk. So, let me just say this, that most of, most of the time when I hear dispensationalism being talked about in public, most of the time when I hear dispensationalism being talked about in public, even by people who are very theologically educated and are very good in a whole lot of other areas, many times when I hear dispensationalism being talked about, what I hear is a dispensationalism that in many cases is almost a century old and is not the dispensationalism that is being discussed and being treated and being written about today. And, I, and I, when I say that, I don't even have in mind progressive dispensationalism. I have in mind even the revised dispensationalism that's represented by the people who taught me, like Charles Ryrie and John Walbert and some of the, uh, J. Dwight Pentecost and Stan Toussaint, some of, whom, some of those people have been here uh, to New Zealand and to Australia. So, um, so I don't recognize it. And, and, I, and the criticisms that come against it are something I don't recognize. And to some degree, I don't feel the criticism because I say, that's not what I believe. But oftentimes, what I do feel is this inherent uh, engagement with something that, um, that no longer is where most dispensationalists are, which I think is regrettable. Because I think we ought to know each other well enough and better enough to be up to date on what it is we're thinking. And the reason I do something like this is in the hopes of, of, uh, of helping you uh, with that. Whether you agree or disagree with me, at least let's agree to disagree about what I believe, okay, rather than something I don't. So with that in mind, I press ahead. Hopefully, may the stereotype rest in peace. Okay, now, the reality. The reality is that dispensationalism at its core, in my judgment, is about, administrative, about the administrative program of God. Okay? It's not about the future, although it entails the future. It's about the administrative program of God. A dispensation is simply a Latin word for a Greek word, oikonomia. And oikonomia is where we get our word economy from. It has to do with a structure or an arrangement of things. So Charles Ryrie used to say, although reform people didn't like this, Charles Ryrie used to say, everyone is a dispensationalist, it's just a matter of what degree. Anyone who doesn't take a sacrifice to church is a dispensationalist. Anyone who worships on a Sunday and not a Saturday is a dispensationalist. Why? Because the program or the economy of God changed, and with that change, certain practices that used to be regular were no longer regular. That's what a dispensational shift and a dispensation is. Everyone accepts the difference between the old dispensation, what we call the period of the Old Testament, and the new dispensation, what came with Christ. Everyone recognizes something happened there. So then the question is the degree to which, to which this happened. Historically, what dispensationalists have held and what dispensationalists have emphasized is discontinuity, particularly the idea that, it, that the church is not Israel and Israel is not the church. That's the real... If you want to know a reformed person vis-a-vis -vis a dispensationalist person, and, and this is a risk being an oversimplification, but I think it's basically fair. In the reformed tradition, the church becomes Israel. The church replaces Israel. Now, I don't mean that in a negative sense when I say it that way. The point is, is that the church has become and now functions in the way Israel was originally designed to function because she has become the beneficiary in Jesus Christ of the promises that come to and through covenant. I actually think that's true to the extent that the church functions on analogy with Israel so she can be called a kingdom of priests like Israel was, that kind of thing. Now when some people hear that, they go, that doesn't sound like a dispensationalist. And some dispensationalists, when they hear me say that, say, that doesn't sound like a dispensationalist. To which my answer is, I don't care. I think that's what the scripture teaches. Okay. So I think there is some continuity here. In fact, part of what progressive dispensationalism is trying to do and to argue for is a greater degree of continuity than dispensationalism, dispensationalism has recognized. 
But when a dispensationalist or non-dispensationalist says to me, when you make that move, you're no longer dispensational, I'll say, well, wait a minute, let me finish. Okay? Because I also happen to believe that the church doesn't simply replace Israel. And I also, do, I also believe there's a future for ethnic Israel that the Bible teaches. There's a distinction between Israel and church in the program and administrations of God. And it shows itself in the way the program in Israel is talked about in Scripture. Now, when a dispensationalist hears that, they go, amen. When a reformed person hears that, they go, oh, no. So, um, uh, so, you know, so we end up, that's where the discussion is. So we, progressive dispensationalism has been this thing that has kind of tried to sail between the older dispensationalism and the reformed tradition. I will tell you that we're on the edge of a new element to the discussion because in the United States there's a book that's in the process. It's, it's, it, it may be just out or about to be released by Crossway called um, Covenant Kingdom. Covenant and Kingdom. And it is going to argue for a progressive covenant theology. Okay? This is the covenant people coming back sailing between where progressive dispensationalism is and covenant theology is. And what's really fun in theology is when you make more boxes, it makes more confusion. But basically, they're going to try, I think, and argue. One of the guys who wrote the book, Peter Gentry, was a classmate of mine at Dallas Seminary. Uh, and he teaches at Southern. He's a dear brother. And, uh, um, and I think he's going to try and argue there are some things on discontinuity where dispensationalism has it right, and there are some things on continuity where reform has it right, and he doesn't think we've come far enough. So we'll see. I, I'm anxious to see what he says. He's a, he's a sharp thinker and, and worth interacting with. And uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing what progressive covenant theology is. If we ever get to the point where we get to progressive covenant dispensationalism, we may have arrived at heaven. Anyway, so um, here, is, here is the point that I want to make about covenantal uh, administration and the, and the covenants. And that's the next slide. I think all the core covenants of promise, I'm going to distinguish between the covenants of promise and what I would call an administrative covenant. The covenants of promise are the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the New Covenant. I think those, promise, those covenants all have already not yet features in them that Jesus Christ realized. That's where your continuity comes from. So I'm quite comfortable with the idea that the world has been blessed in the seed of Abraham and that Gentiles participate as seed of Abraham a la uh, Genesis, uh, Galatians 3. I'm quite comfortable with that idea. Uh, I think that's what Paul is teaching in Galatians chapter 3. And in fact, all dispensationalists have always recognized and already feature to the Abrahamic covenant. The next covenant that tended to be discussed in dispensationalism was the new covenant. The old position was that the new covenant was written to Israel and to Judah. And because we believe in a very, very literal hermeneutic, this is why I'm going to play with this term, very, very, that covenant was made only with them. So that any Gentile inclusion in the new covenant can't be that covenant. In the time of Lewis Sperry Chafer, okay, who, who lived until the early 1950s, to show you how far back we're going, in, the, in an older, more classical kind of dispensationalism, he held to two new covenants. He held to the idea that there was a new covenant that related to Israel. There was a new covenant that Jesus brought. They were two distinct covenants, but they overlapped. Okay, and that's why it looked confusing. Okay? His, one of his students, John Walbert, okay, who lived until the early part of this last decade, um, and taught, was teaching at the seminary well into the end of the 20th century, and who was a revised dispensationalist as opposed to a classical dispensationalist, came to the view that two new covenants didn't work. What he argued for is the idea that there was a, there was a new covenant uh, and the church got the benefits of the application of the new covenant, and to some degree it was already not yet. He kind of fudged on exactly how that worked theologically, but, but he saw a relationship between them. Both he and Charles Ryrie changed the view of the two new covenants and came to, uh, came to uh, renounce that view and to move to another view. They changed their mind on this, showing the difference between classical and revised dispensations. We progressives came along and said, let's not, let's not uh, be subtle about this. 
Basically, we said the new covenant is something that applies to both Israel and the church. It's one new covenant. We participate in it already, and that's a given. And what revised dispensationalism had pretty much acknowledged, we just straight out affirmed. Um, but the big difference between progressive dispensationalism and revised dispensationalism was on the Davidic covenant. Um, and again, if you think about in the Reformed tradition, all these covenants are realized in Jesus Christ, and you don't have, even have this discussion. Um, what classical dispensationalism said is, is that the Davidic covenant is only going to be realized in the millennium. There is no already at all. Revised dispensationalism, for the most part, held that same view, that, that when we're talking about Davidic covenant, Davidic kingship, Jesus' messianism, that's something that's going to be realized in the millennium, because, day, because Jesus has to be king over Israel to realize those promises. That was the idea that David's throne and God's throne are not the same thing. They need to be distinguished. And that's strictly a future thing. So when Jesus goes to the right hand of the Father, he goes to the right hand of the Father, and he sits and he waits until all the enemies have been made a footstool for his feet. In the millennium, he's going to exercise his rule and authority. That's what the Old Testament's talking about. Okay? That was both classical and revised on the Davidic covenant. They're very similar. We came along and said that doesn't work. If you were listening at all okay, to my second lecture, and you will see that what I, what I see and have argued for, this is actually one of the contributions, my contribution to the tweaking. What I was arguing for is a realization of messianic activity in the distribution of the spirit that's affirmed in Acts 2. So the Davidic covenant is already not yet and provides a basis of continuity for the kingdom promise. The kingdom is already here in an initial sense, even though I also believe in a millennium yet to come. So I'm premillennial. Um, so this covenantal relationship is different. It sees a lot more continuity. It has ethical overtones for how you read the Gospels. It's, uh, it would be very hard to, to listen to me and think that I'm reading the gospel in a way a classical dispensationalist reads the gospel because of the way I view things like the Sermon on the Mount, the whole ethical emphasis of the gospel for today, that kind of thing. Older dispensationalists, the more classical dispensationalists, tended to distinguish between an economy that was written and presented under law and therefore did not apply to the church and that which came under Paul when we passed the cross and we moved into a new administration. And so we apply what Paul says directly to the church in a way we don't in the, uh, in the Gospels. Revised dispensationalists kind of struggled with this area. How do the Gospels apply to the present? And some of them recognized you apply the Sermon on the Mount, it, it carries over. This is Jesus' ethic for discipleship. It, it's no real problem. They might fudge it a little by saying this is indirect application. I'm not going to say that. I think it's directly applicable because I think Jesus is teaching about the kingdom he brings. And he always knew it was coming with a rejection phase, uh, his absence, and a second coming. He always knew that he was bringing, bringing it in that kind of a program. Um, so again, what I'm trying to show you, the differences within dispensationalism alongside um, where I fit. Now, where am I not like Reformed? Because that's the other half of the question. I'm not like the Reformed tradition in simply saying that the church has replaced Israel. I think the church, most of the distinction, I think the church is the new Israel, but put it in quotes. It functions as Israel was called to function in her time and in her period. And it has the roles that Israel had at that time, but not in a way in which it permanently replaces ethnic Israel. What's going to happen, in my view, is, is that there's going to be a huge response of ethnic Israel at the end that actually is going to put Israel in the millennium. Okay? I distinguish, at one level, structurally, between the church, Israel, and the millennium as structures. Let me explain the difference. Israel is a national structure based largely in ethnicity, although there are possibilities for proselytes, but basically it's an ethnic national category. The church is a transnational entity that operates in the midst of Jesus' absence. The church is the body of Christ representing his presence in the midst of his absence. Okay? There will come a time in which Jesus will come back physically and will rule directly. My remark about, about what the millennium is going to be like is no one's going to debate who the pope is in the millennium. Okay? 
So when he comes back, Jesus is going to rule. He's going to be running things for the people of God. And so he will be Pope Jesus the first. And, uh, and, and so, um, so he will be running things. And there will be no debate. And that structure with Jesus present operating directly is a different structure. It's a different organization. It's a different arrangement than a community that functions in its absence only through the presence of the Spirit. So I distinguish Israel, church, and millennium. And I see a role for ethnic Israel uh, as, she, as she embraces Christ before his return and feeds into what the millennium is going to be. So even though the church and Israel overlap in such a way that they function, and you can call the church spiritual Israel, and all the descriptions that you apply to Israel can apply to the church, and even though I think whether you're a Gentile or a Jew, you will always be a Christian because you will come into the community that's operating at whatever time you believe um, through Christ, at least from the cross on, um, that millennial structure is something different than what the church is and what Israel was. The kingdom program overlaps between the church and the millennium. Actually, it extends also into the new heaven and the new earth, which is yet another period. So, so the way I'm different than the Reformed tradition is this role for Israel and the way I see the structures and define the structures of Israel, church, and millennium. Now, just to confuse you even more, okay, I see a unity soteriologically in the fact that Jews and Gentiles, if they believe in this age, are all members of the church, are all Christians, and have an equality with one another. That's a continuity category when we're talking soteriologically. But when we're talking structurally, there's a distinction between the church, the kingdom, and what Israel was. Okay? So, so it all depends on what axis you're on. Okay? Which angle you're looking at things out, whether you have a continuity or a discontinuity. This is, another way to say it is, it's a both and way of dealing with this question rather than an either or. Right? Do I have to choose between a future for Israel and uh, Israel and the church replacing Israel? The answer is, well, no, not really. What, I'm, what you're saying is there's a role for ethnic Israel in the program of God that's ongoing and there also is a role for the church that is ongoing, but they both fold into the millennium. Okay, and that's how you get there. Okay, now that was probably confusing, but that's why I'm going to allow time for questions because questions always lead to confusion. Uh, questions always help to deal with confusion. Let me talk about the law. Okay, the one covenant that I didn't mention in talking about the covenants of promise is what I have just labeled the pro uh, covenant of management or a, a pedagogue covenant, if I can say it that way. That's the Mosaic covenant. It's the covenant that comes alongside the Abrahamic covenant until the Messiah comes. And I think the picture for this is Galatians 3. And here's my point. This will show you another difference in, within the tradition of dispensationalism. Sometimes you'll hear the idea or the model presented that what happened is, is that the church is a parenthesis in the, pra in the program of God. Okay? The church is a parenthesis in the program of God. And, it, and the model goes like this. Jesus offers the kingdom to Israel. Israel rejects the program. In its place comes the church. And the church operates until Israel comes back into the program when she believes at the end. The church is the parenthesis. Now, I don't, I don't hold to this, but I understand why people hold it. Let me try and explain it to you this way. In the Old Testament, when we have the career of Messiah, we have both his offering of salvation and we have his coming in judgment. That's all put together in a tight package in the Old Testament. You see, when it gets described, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 is an example. You see the declaration of the year of Jubilee and the declaration of the, of the vengeance of the Lord all in the same passage. When you pull that apart into two comings, which is what happens with Jesus' coming, you see he redeems now, okay, but he's going to judge later. When you do that, you get a gap. That gap looks like a parenthesis or an addition, something else. It's a fresh revelation on what you had when these two things were discussed on top of one another. So I like to say, from the perspective of the program, strictly seen through the eyes of corporate Israel, it looks like you get a break, okay? Which dispensational is called a parenthesis, okay? To that extent, I get it, okay? But here's what I don't like about it. What I don't like about it is, is that Isaiah always told me 
That Israel would reject the Messiah when she first came. That he was going to be rejected by his own. So this is part of a program. So the old hypothetical question some dispensationalists used to ask of, well, if Israel had accepted Jesus on his first coming, there wouldn't have been a second coming. It's a wonderful idea, but it was never thought about. Okay? Because it wasn't in the program. So I don't think it's worth speculating about and, and thinking about in those kinds of terms. Here's what I like to say. What I like to say is, is that the parenthesis in the promise program of God actually is the law and not the church. Okay? Now here's what I'm saying. You had the promise. The promise came along as a pedagogue until the promise reached maturity. Once it reached maturity and the heir came, you had no need for the pedagogue anymore. I think that's the argument of Galatians 3. Is that the law was brought in alongside the promise to administer it and to be an administrative element in it for a time. And then once the promise was realized, you didn't need that administrative aid anymore. If I can think of an analogy, it's like learning to ride a bike. Okay? And when you're a kid learning to ride a bike, you have training wheels. Right? Okay? And you slowly raise the training wheels to the point that the person can ride the bike without the training wheels. Once you're able to ride the bike, you pull the training wheels off. Okay? That's the picture of the law. So that's how I see the law functioning in Galatians 3. I also see Galatians 3 making the point that it's possible to be sons of Abraham while being Gentiles. But that all happens, and this is a very reformed idea, but that all happens through the incorporation that we have in Christ. The reason I am able, or you are able, whether we are a Jew or a Gentile, to be a son of Abraham, in the sense that we're talking about in relationship to the promise, is because of what Jesus Christ has done. He is the heir who is the inheritor of all the promises and everything that I have as a result of what God has done, I have not on the basis of my own or who I am, but because I get it through him. Now that's a very reformed idea that I affirm as a progressive dispensationalist. Okay, so that's another area of overlap with uh, covenantal theology. Okay, this brings us to, the major, to a major area of discussion. I have two slides left, so I'm almost done. Um, and that has to do with the future of Israel. Here's my problem with Stephen Sizer, Gary Burge, et al. Okay, when they simply present one side of the scripture that says we all are incorporated into Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile in Christ, all distinctions have been wiped out, etc., 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 I say you're doing a good job with two-thirds of the New Testament and you've ignored one-third of the New Testament. Luke Acts. Okay? And it's bad for something to fall into Luke Acts and for me to have to treat it. Okay? Because I've spent a little time there. So here's when Gary Burge wrote his book on Jesus and the land, he did not discuss a single relevant text out of Luke Acts. I did a presentation two years ago in London at a conference on future for Israel in which I went through all the passages in Luke Acts that deal with this and then I came to Romans 9 to 11 to read Romans 9 to 11 in light of what we're going to say. I'm going to try really briefly to do this for you. Okay? And I'm going to start in Luke 13. In Luke 13, Jesus is in the process of declaring the judgment on Israel for her rejecting the Messiah. She is in covenantal unfaithfulness, in corporate covenantal unfaithfulness. Verse 34 of chapter 13. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken. I tell you, you will not see me until you say... Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, that's step one. Now, let's stop and think for a second. If the passage had said this, I might be a covenantal theologian. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me, period. But that isn't what the text says. The text says, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay? So this judgment on Israel has a time period attached to it. It's holding out the possibility that Israel may, as a corporate entity, come to the point of saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, some people say, well, wasn't that realized when Jesus came into Jerusalem? 
After all, the disciples, when he came in, said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But think about the entry into Jerusalem as it's portrayed in Luke. Jesus comes in, the disciples say, Blessed is he who comes into the name of the Lord. But the Pharisees stop and say, Tell your disciples to stop saying that. Not only that, just slightly later in 1941 to 44, there's a prediction of the fact that Jerusalem's going to be judged because she's missed the time of her messianic visitation. So the point is, the disciples put on offer the opportunity to be responsive to Jesus as corporate Israel, but the leadership rejected it and the city rejected it. No one came out to Jesus and escorted him to the time and said, Welcome, you are our king. In fact, Jesus had to say to the Pharisees, if I tell the disciples to be quiet, these stones will cry out. In Scripture, when creation speaks, we're supposed to listen. Or there's the threat of creation speaking, we're supposed to listen. So, so there's an until here, and even though Luke 19 in the entry offered an opportunity for this to happen, it was not received at that time. So it's still in place. Second indication that this is going on, so, so what I'm arguing here is, is that there's a judgment, but it's signaled to be temporary. If there's a response by corporate Israel, the judgment will be lifted. Second place where we see this is in Luke 21. In Luke 21, we're in the Olivet Discourse. Now, the Olivet Discourse in Luke is not identified with Olivet, first of all. But secondly, there's an interesting thing that happens in Luke. Luke talks more about the destruction of A.D. 70 as a model or pattern for what the end is like than the other two gospel writers who write about this discourse. And in the midst of it, he says some pretty interesting things, starting in 2120. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. That's Jerusalem's desolation. In Matthew and in Mark, where we get this desolation, we have reference to the abomination of desolation or the abomination of desolation that you can read about in the book of Daniel. The first comes from Mark and the second comes from Matthew. It's a different description of desolation. Okay, That's a very particular description of the Antichrist in the holy place. This is a more generalized description of general desolation of the city. That's why I think AD 70 is in view here primarily. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are inside the city depart. Let those who are not out in the country enter it. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for those who are with child and for those who give suck in those days. For great distress will be upon the earth and wrath upon this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now again, I'm going to plead with you. Okay? Don't put a period after Gentiles. Okay? If the text had read, Jerusalem will be tanned down by the Gentiles, period, I might be a covenant and reformed oriented person. But it says, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, I ask you, in the mind of Scripture, if you're going to have a times of the Gentiles, what's going to be the alternative? The times of? Times of the Jews, the times of Israel. That's the contrast, Israel and the nations. So this looks again like it's setting some kind of a limitation on the kind of judgment that's being described. And it looks like it's holding out for the future some kind of a possibility of a future for Israel. I'm not done. This next passage is a passage I've already mentioned. It's the passage in Acts chapter 1. Remember I mentioned to you when we mentioned this text that the disciples asked a question after being in the first use of the Old Testament in the new class with Jesus, for which we do not have notes, unfortunately. Okay, And when it was all said and done in chapter 6, the first question they want to know, because they think, well, Jesus has been crucified now. He's been exalted. The thing that must be left is what comes with the exaltation. That must be the judgment and the restoration. So their question is, so when they come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They're asking this question before we've even brought Gentiles in any significant way into view. Now, John Stott handles this text. Okay? He says, this is the wrong question. It's a bad question. They've really missed it. I don't get the sense of that from Jesus' reply. The sense I get is, this is basically the Father's business. But I don't get a correction of the question. 
It says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. That looks like an answer that accepts the premise of the question. It just answers, not for you to know. Not your business. That's it. But in order for a reformed model to be correct, this has to be a bad question. Okay, because Israel has to be redefined. But Israel can't be redefined when this question is being asked, okay, because we haven't gotten to the point where Gentiles are included in a significant way. So I think it's a good question. It's just deferred. It's not your business to know. Okay? And then it goes on to talk about the mission. This, I think, prioritizes how we think about eschatology, and I talked about that in the last lecture, about how I think that works. So, that, so what I'm saying now comes alongside what I said earlier. My whole point is, is the disciples still believe in a restoration of Israel when, we have, when they have had 40 days to talk with the Lord about, the God, about God's program. They know a little bit about it when they ask this question, and this is the question they ask, and there's no signal, real signal, that they've missed it. The last piece in the equation from Acts comes in Acts chapter 3, and I've covered this one already too, but I just want to reaffirm the way it fits. Acts chapter 3, in part, is actually Peter's exposition of what he learned in light of what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1. And what Peter says is this, verse 19 of chapter 3, Repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing is a, is a very good Old Testament phrase. Not only is times of refreshing a very good Old Testament phrase, but what he says next, And he may send the Christ appointed for you, who heaven must receive until the time for the establishing of all things is the way some translations read, but you could very easily translate this the time of the restoration of all things. This is restoration language. Also coming out of the Old Testament. That all that God spoke by the mouths of the prophets of old. Here's my point. If you want to know what Jesus is going to do in the future when he comes back, you already have it recorded for you in the Hebrew Scriptures. And Israel and a future for Israel is everywhere in those texts. So whatever you do with Israel, including including Gentiles as a part of spiritual Israel, which you might be able to do on the basis of progressive revelation, what it won't allow you to do is to pull out the ethnic Israel that's a part of that. Okay? That's a very, very important point. That's why I object to replacement theology. I reject to replacement theology because even though it adds in something that's there, it replaces it with something that shouldn't be replaced. Okay? I don't have a problem with the idea of saying Gentiles have come in alongside Israel to be blessed. They're fully blessed in Christ. They're fully incorporated with Christ. They're equal to Jews. Just don't take the Jews out of the mix. Why? Because in the end, the point that's going to be made to the world is that God has reconciled both Jew and Gentile to one another. There's got to be enough Jews there to be reconciled. Okay? Or else the testimony is lost. I think that's exactly what Paul is saying in Romans 9 to 11. What Paul is saying in Romans 9 to 11 at the start is, I weep for Israel, my brethren. I wish that I were accursed and they be saved. Now, when he introduces Romans 9 to 11, he cannot be talking about responding Gentiles when he says that. That's impossible. He wouldn't want to be accursed for people who've already believed. That makes no sense. A little passion coming out. <laughs> so the topic of Israel in Romans 9 to 11 is ethnic Israel. Now he does go on to say, not everyone who's Israel is Israel. Why? Because there are some Jews who have believed and a lot of Jews who haven't. So what does he talk about in chapter 10? He talks about a remnant. He talks about a remnant. A remnant of Jews. In fact, I think the remnant is the bridge and continuity between the old era and the new that keeps the program of God on a continuity track. Because the remnant saints complete the promises for the original recipients for whom it was intended, even though other recipients are added in as the program progresses. 
So when he comes to the end and he's, he's shaking his finger at the Gentiles, don't get arrogant, chapter 11. Don't get arrogant because if the natural branches can be grafted out and unnatural branches can be grafted in, that's where believing Gentiles are discussed quite clearly. Okay? And they're even anticipated in some of the remarks of the way Hosea is used earlier on in Romans 9 to 11. They're also there. Okay, I can make out of Israel that this is no Israel into Israel. I think, I think that includes Gentiles. Okay, that's the unnatural branches being grafted in. But he says, if you get arrogant, guess what God can do? He can graft in those natural branches just like he did those unnatural branches that included you. And then he goes on to say, he's anticipating a time when the Lord returns and all Israel will be saved. And he's used the term Israel fairly consistently through these chapters in doing that. Okay? So my point is, look at Romans, look at Romans 11. And then I'm going to illustrate this so it'll make sense, hopefully. Because I find theology sometimes doesn't make sense, but illustrations do. I'm not quite sure how that works, but sometimes it does. Verse 25 of chapter 11, Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon a part of Israel, and guess what word comes next? That little word until. Okay? I would be a Reformed theologian if the New Testament didn't use until so much. Until the full number of Gentiles comes in. And so all Israel will be saved, as is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. So we're going to get a full array of the anticipated Gentiles, and lo and behold, we're also going to get a pretty full array of Jews who are from Jacob alongside of them. This will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. It's an invocation of how the new covenant will finally be applied in a meaningful way to Israel. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Verse 29 is the key to this. If you want to understand how this works and how this can be, verse 29 is the key. Here's what verse 29 is saying. God is faithful. When he calls someone into covenant, he is faithful. He will keep his promises, including to an obstinate Israel. He will faithfully restore them. Now, why is that important? He's just come off of Romans 8, in which he's made the point, nothing can separate us from the love of God. He's talking about everybody. How do I know that's true if the commitment God made to Israel isn't fulfilled with Israel? Couldn't God turn his back on us like he did on them? That's Romans 9 to 11. Romans 9 to 11 says, that commitment to Israel is going to last. God will bring it back one day. So the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. If he commits himself to covenant, he has committed himself in covenant to the people he made the covenant with. Even if he expands that covenant later to include others who weren't originally in it. The, you don't lose the originals when you get the expansion. That's why I'm against replacement theology. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but now receive mercy because of their disobedience, so they now become disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may receive mercy. It's looking forward to a time when the thing reverses. For God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all. And then he praises the depths and the riches of God. Let me tell you what, let me give you an illustration of what this is like. Let's assume that you're going to seminary and let's assume that a seminary ex, uh, education is expensive. Okay? All right? Let's assume that seminary... And so I say to you because I'm wealthy... And I say to you, because I really like you and I think you have potential for ministry, I'm going to support you in your ministry. And you're single when I say this. Okay? You're a single person. So you go to seminary and you dive into the books and you start to study. And while you're in seminary, you meet the love of your life. Okay? So you're not only a theologian, you're a happy person. Okay? <laughs> All right? 
And, and, and so, so you're happy. And, and it goes along and you fall in love and met the one whom God has sent from before the foundations of the world. I mean, you make this as Calvinist as you want, okay? This is good, all right? And, and, and so you get married. Now you come to me and you say, you said you would support me in seminary. But what I did not make clear to you when I initially made this commitment is, what was the nature of that commitment? Was it to you personally, just you? Or was it also to the spouse who would, has now become attached to you? You don't know the answer to my question until I write the check. Do I write the check for your tuition? Do I write the check for your books? Do I write the check for your tuition and books and your living expenses? Okay? All of a sudden, the spouse who became connected to you because you had a promise... Okay. All of a sudden, the spouse becomes a beneficiary if I write the expense for the living. So I expand the scope of the promise, but that doesn't mean I've lost the original beneficiary. Okay, I'm thinking the scriptures work like that when you think about them comprehensively. There's a commitment made to Israel, and for now, the analogy doesn't quite work because of the time frame, but for now, the spouse is getting the amount of the benefits because of the connection that comes in through Christ. Okay? Actually, the commitment's made to Christ. Christ comes commitment, and the, you have a child. Okay, let's just make, have fun with the illustration. You have a child. Am I still writing? I'm only writing a check for, the, for just the husband. I'm only writing a check for the husband and the wife. I'm now writing a check for the husband and the wife and the children. Let's say you're prolific. Okay? <laughs> All right? Okay, you have many children. Okay, I'm writing the check for the spouse. I'm writing the check for the, for the husband only. I'm writing the check for this brood that you now are raising. Okay? The, the promise can expand in all kinds of directions, but that doesn't mean even, even let's say the first guy walks away from his ministry for a time, and I've been supporting you. He walks away from his ministry, but the spouse is still faithful. The children are still in the family. Do I stop supporting him or do, because I've come into this relationship where I've connected to the spouse, I now write a check and I write a check to the spouse and to the children even though the husband has walked away. And let's say, miracle of miracles, the husband comes back. Now I write a check for the whole group. That's the picture. God has made a commitment and what he is, what he is predicting is that even though they are away, they are away for a time. They are away until, until she says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. That suggests a limitation and a shift administratively, a dispensational shift in the program of God. Um, I don't have this on a slide, but I need to comment on it before I go to the last slide, and it's this. If you ask me why I believe in a millennium, I believe in a millennium because I think the Old Testament teaches both an intermediate kingdom of God that's on this earth that completes this earth's history, as well as a new heaven and a new earth. A consummation that comes in two stages. I also believe in a millennium because of a problem that I have in Revelation 20, with the idea that the number is just a metaphor. Okay, let me just read this to you this way and hope that it makes the point. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 and following. Well, let me start in verse 1. Okay, everywhere where I see thousand years, I'm going to read metaphor. Okay, and the reason I'm going to do that is to make the point of how often thousand years is said in these handful of verses. Because I think if it were a metaphor, you wouldn't say it as much as it's being said. But just follow with me. Okay, buy in here. Verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding his hand in his hand the key of the bottomless pit in a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient servant, who is a devil, and Satan bound him for a metaphor. And he threw him into the pit and shut it up and sealed it over him that he should deceive the nations no more till the metaphor was ended. And after that he must be loose for a little while. I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom judgment was committed. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony of Jesus and the word of God. And they had been marked for worship of the beast and its image and had not received its mark on their heads, on the forehead or their heads. And they came to life and reigned with Christ 
a metaphor. Then he rested the dead, came to life until the metaphor was ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who shares in the first resurrection. Over the second resurrection, they have no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him. A metaphor. And when the metaphor is ended, Satan will be loosed from his prison. Look at how often that figure appears in the space of those verses. And then put this little additional factor in the background. This is apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature is about theodicy. Theodicy is, is the question of how God deals with the problem of evil and injustice. One of the ways Apocalypse deals with the issue of theodicy and injustice is to say God has a calendar of events that are going to unfold. He has a program and a plan that you can trust in even though it hasn't happened yet. When I think of a calendar, I don't think of a metaphor. When I think of a calendar, I think of a schedule. So my point is, this is happening so often in such as, if he just wanted to say uh, Christ is going to rule for a short period or an indefinite period of time or whatever a metaphor, he might have said it once or twice. But there's a huge sequence of events here that are marked off as the beginning of the thousand years and the end of the thousand years, so I don't think we're metaphor. Or if we're a metaphor, it's a metaphor for something happening between and before something else that's going to be the new heaven and the new earth. Okay? Even if I grant you that a thousand years is not a literally 1,365 days a year plus an eclipse, uh, 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 not an eclipse year, uh, uh, a leap year every now and again, every four years. Okay? Even if I grant you that, it's still a calendrical term that points to an intermediate kingdom before we get to the new heavens and the new earth with things happening in between. That's my point. That's why I'm premillennial. Okay. Why does all this matter? Why does all this matter? We come back to where we started today. Okay? We come back to the fact that salvation is ultimately about reconciliation. It's the reconciliation of Jew and Gentile into one group. That reconciliation is one of the ways God shows his wisdom to the world. That's Ephesians 2 and 3. He took that which is far away and that which is near, and he brought them together into one body, and the world looks at it, and the angels look at it. This is chapter 3. They look at what God has done, and they go, how magnificent is the wisdom of God. If the church is 99.9% .9 Gentile, snow white pure. Okay? If the church is 99.9% .9 Gentile, that message is gone. I don't think that's where the New Testament is going. The New Testament is going to a place in which Jew and Gentile, in which the nations and the people are wrapped together in a new community of God that God has brought together. And we see this reconciliation where they get along with one another where before they didn't, along with all kinds of other nations. And we go, only God could do that in Jesus Christ. And so it matters because two things are at stake. Not just reconciliation, but the other reason it matters is that the faithfulness of God in the call and gifts of God being irrevocable is also at stake. And if there's one thing that the Word of God teaches, it's this. If God promises something and His Word is staked on it, He will do it no matter how unbelievable it sounds.